the concern is neighbors suddenly find out there's going to be a cell tower in their neighborhood or at the school and a lot of times we're told, and this is not just with the cell tower process, but in the county, well, it's too late. The plants have already been set. And so one of the main purposes of having this discussion is to find out what the process is, what the steps are, and at what point do the residents get involved early in the process enough to affect the outcome. So I want to um, thank you all so very much for coming. And um, I wanted to introduce Dan Abeta who's from the Federal Communications Commission. He's the Assistant Chief of the Wireless Bureau Spectrum and Competition Policy Division, working primarily with NEPA, is that right? National Environmental Policy Act adjudication. His staff is responsible for ensuring that all wireless facilities comply with the Commission's environmental regulations, implementing the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969 including a nationwide programmatic agreement that covers cell towers. He's been with the Commission since 1983, and during his tenure at the Commission, he's held legal positions in the Enforcement Division of the former Mass Media Bureau and the Mobile Services and Terrorist Division of the former Common Carrier Bureau. Thanks. Um, Marjorie Williams is sitting over there, but I'll introduce you anyway. She's the Franchise Manager for Montgomery County and she serves as chair of the Transmission Facilities Coordinating Group. Since its creation in 1996, the Transmission Facilities Coordinating Group has recommended placement of over 1,300 transmission facilities at 428 locations within the county. And giving the county presentation is Bob Honeycutt. He's with uh, Columbia Telecommunications Corporation, and he serves as the tower coordinator for the county's Transmission Facilities Coordinating Group. And by doing that, he reviews all the applications to site antennas in the county. And he works with engineers to evaluate applications for their accuracy and their compliance with zoning and uh, TFCG requirements. He's also the liaison with South Carrier representatives, with the public, and with the committee members. And he prepares recommendations for each application and has had the experience of uh, reviewing over 2,500 antenna siting applications, as well as developing policies, ordinances, and regulations regarding cell towers. And Sue Present is here. She's had extensive professional career leading national, regional, and local agencies and organizations that focus on ensuring decent housing and thriving communities. And, and part as a, as a result of this, when a special exception application was filed to site a cell tower in her own residential neighborhood, it appeared obvious to her that the proposed use could pose threats to the surrounding residents and their homes. As such, she became a prominent opponent of the cell tower application, and she brought together a large group of people in the community to bring to the fore issues that had never been considered really in the county regarding cell tower zoning applications. So, with that, I guess what I'd like to do is ask each of you, I know you have a short presentation, and maybe what we could do is start with the federal picture, and then work to the county, and then Sue, you could talk about the experiences regarding neighborhood organizations and working within the, the county. Very good. Thank you. Well, with that, thank you to Paula for inviting the FCC to join you this evening. Uh, we always say that you, in, you, when you work with the federal government, you're really not going to learn anything until you leave your headquarters office and go outside the beltway and see what people think. So here we are. <laughs> so uh, I have an opportunity. You get an opportunity to hear from me, and hopefully I'll get to hear from you in terms of what your concerns are. Uh, first question is, how many of you received some type of an electronic gift for the holidays uh, that uses broadband? Okay, smartphone, laptop, uh, Kindle with Wi-Fi capacity. Any of these? Raise your hands high. Okay, well, it's not surprising. Okay, these were the most popular gifts that were given this year. Uh, and I think all of us are aware that there's an explosion in terms of the use of broadband, of 
the smartphone type um, tools that are on average, every home has at least three of these wi wireless uh, personal uh, types of smartphones, laptops, et cetera. So, you know, before long, just about every room in the house is going to have them. Your, your cars are going to have them as well. Uh, the country has seen an explosion of these mobile devices, not just with individuals, but with businesses, schools, and campuses. All of us have probably seen e-learning, um, hospitals, telemedicine. Uh, emergency services and public safety, all of these use broadband services. What I wanted to do first is uh, give you a little bit of uh, background in terms of how it is that these wireless services are licensed. Back in the early 90s, Congress decided that we should auction Spectrum. So it's basically the highest bidder. Okay, so the licensees, many of whom you're, you're familiar with, they, they auction, they put up money for this spectrum. What they received was a license, meaning it doesn't belong to them, but they received a license to provide service in a geographic area. And of course, there were requirements for that. There had to be a certain amount of, they had to ensure a certain amount of capacity and, and service requirements. That said, once they receive their license, they are free to put their towers where they choose to meet the commission's requirements of capacity and service. In other words, the FCC doesn't see where they place their towers. The FCC doesn't know where they place their towers because they're not required to file anything with us except for towers that are 200 feet or taller. These were required to be submitted to us to ensure that they comply with federal aviation marking and lighting requirements. So we do have a database called a ASR, Antenna System Registration Database, that keeps track of towers that are over 200 feet and above. But otherwise, we're not aware of, of the towers that are below that height. That said, Congress also mandated that regulation of the placement of towers rests with the local and state government. Okay? So regulation does not rest with the FCC in terms of the towers that you, you have concerns with, the towers that are near the schools, the tower that appears to have a visual adverse visual effect on your home, or just a tower that you hate. You just look at it and you say, I hate that tower, it's ugly. Okay, that responsibility, the placement of those towers, rests with your state and your local government. So, it goes without saying, if you don't like a tower, you better be involved in your local and state government. Okay, that's where you have a say, that's where you can stop a tower. Okay, if it gets beyond your local and state government, I wish you a lot of luck in stopping the towers. <laughs> then it becomes much, much harder the FCC does maintain responsibility for ensuring that all towers comply with uh, an environmental statute known as NEPA. Probably everybody's heard of it. It's an old statute. Tell us what the acronym means. The National Environmental Policy Act. Thank okay. you. Uh, now, NEPA is implemented by each agency uh, individually. They choose which statutes to, to comply with. For our purposes, NEPA means these towers that go up have to comply with the Historic Preservation Act, with endangered species, with wildlife statutes. There are RF requirements, so they have to comply with the FCC's uh, radio frequency emissions, one of the other concerns that the public has, that these emissions could also have a adverse effect on humans or the, the environment. So, the only time that a licensee has to submit something with us is if that tower has been found to, if the, if the construction of the tower would have a significant impact on one of those areas. Okay, if they conduct the review and they find that there's no, uh, no effect, no, no impact, then they're free to construct 
their towers. Who's the they in that case? I'm sorry? You said if they conduct the review, who's the they? The in that case? licensees. Okay, so uh, Verizon, any of the companies that are building their towers, typically what they do is they hire a consultant. Okay, there's a cottage industry of consultants that do the work for them. And so in other words, we don't see the, the submission, okay? They'll submit something to us saying, an application saying they've complied, they've done what they're supposed to do. But remember, your Congress in, in issuing auction authority also set up a deregulatory model so that we don't get to see everything that comes in. The paperwork is submitted, they check block that they've complied with all these rules, and that's it. The tower goes up. Now, we get involved if somebody complains about the tower, okay, say, and it has to fall within one of our areas. In other words, if you, one of you has said, I don't like that tower, I want, I want you to stop it. And that's all you said. We'd send you a nice little note, <laughs> spelling out a rule saying, you know, good luck. But if you use the magic words, we believe they didn't go through the historic preservation process. We believe it has, an it was built in a wetland and we don't think that they went through the process, then we'll take a look at it, then we'll ask the company to submit their documentation. So you have to use the magic words. I mean, there is an opportunity to participate. In other words, NEPA has an opportunity to participate at a number of uh, spots in the process. Yes. Could Paula. you talk a little bit about environmental justice in <clears throat> NEPA? Because that seems like that could. Uh, oh. That's not a that's not an issue for the FCC. Oh. Okay. Yep. Okay. Just like that, it's not. Did not know that. Yeah. Some agencies look at environmental justice. Some agencies look at cumulative effects. Okay. For example, let's say a licensee, Verizon, for example, was going to build ten towers in a very confined area. Okay, NEPA has a uh, provision that talks about cumulative effects. In other words, you could argue that the cumulative effect of all of these towers would put, have an adverse effect. Okay, but the FCC doesn't recognize the cumulative effect argument. It does not. Does not. Correct. Right, so we just look at individual construction. So one tower is all we're going to look at. We're not going to. We're not going to look at the impact of two or more towers. It's going to be an individual assessment. So the key with the FCC is that you have to get involved early in the process. Now here's what you should know. Okay, the FCC bears overall responsibility for compliance with NEPA. Okay, so if the company does it wrong or they didn't do what they were supposed to do and you you uh, submit a complaint with us, okay? We're responsible, not the company. We delegated all of this responsibility to the companies. This is in the, the congressional model. So they serve as our delegates. They have a license, but the FCC is responsible. So if you sent a complaint and said, FCC, I want you to look into this. You're responsible to look into it. You'd be correct, yes. Yes, the companies, the consulting companies right. that carry out the NEPA uh, right. investigations to right. make sure that everything's kosher, right. how are they selected? Because if the licensee can select a company that they know will give them the results that they want, then it cannot necessarily be fair and objective. How well, do you get around that problem? Okay, well, let me start. Let, you want? let me start with the premise that nothing is fair in this world. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're looking for fairness, you're going to have to wait for life after this. Okay? <laughs> there is no fairness in this world unless you found fairness somewhere, and then I'll, I'll talk to you after this. Okay. Um, yes, they do choose their licensees, and their licensees do what they tell them. They get they get paid by them. They're paid experts. Right, they're paid experts, but. We have, the FCC has a very unique uh, professional on our staff. <coughs> They're called a historic preservation expert. They've worked in these fields for, like the gentleman who was on our staff, Steve Del Sordo, has worked on the federal level, state level. He's been a consultant. He, he represents you in terms of making sure that people have done their work. So if you raise a complaint that the application that was submitted with all this documentation really doesn't, it's not accurate. He will look at it and he'll say, you know, you're right, it's not accurate. 
okay, they've done the job incorrectly. So there is a watchdog at the FCC. There is a, a person who will review the, the submissions to make sure that they are accurate. Well, it sounds to me like, let us say, a civic group in opposition to a cell, fire would all, cell tower would almost have to hire their own expert to go over the data provided by the licensee's expert and try to make sure that it's kosher or not and be able to pick holes in it. If, uh, if you were serious about stopping uh, an application or a proposed construction, that would probably be a good idea to do because these companies are in the business of building towers and you know they uh, they want to get them up as quickly as possible just to, just to kind of give you a little bit more background the, the bird's eye view of what's happening right now okay initially when towers were built towers were built tall towers were built for voice okay so that you could get a call and that you wouldn't drop your call okay those towers have largely been built. There's going to be other towers built, but largely those have been built. Okay, so now we're at the stage with broadband, people aren't so much concerned about voice, they're concerned about data, they're concerned about video streaming, pictures. So what we've done now is we've moved from the macro, the tall towers, to the micro. Okay, so for example, in the Rockville area, everybody, every lawyer, probably every professional or non-professional, has their little smartphone and they want this stuff and they want it now. Okay, the only way that you can do that is you have to have micro cells. Okay, and we're in the process of, of um, working with, with various groups so that licensees can build out their micro cells. They're, they go with different names. They're called Pico cells, micros. There's another system called a DAS system, DAS, Distributed Antenna System. These were on top of telephone poles. So you, what you're gonna see is a node. It's gonna be like a box, a little, usually it's on top of the telephone pole. They try to get it as high. It's usually about this high, kind of a white round box. You're gonna see them on different uh, telephone poles. That's so that the, the people who work in that area are gonna be able to download their information quickly. Yes? Question um, yeah. on this uh, NEPA. Right. On, on the one hand, you say that uh, you folks have cognizance of it, but on the other, there's a rule about some cumulative aspects, which I don't understand. I'd like you to further elaborate, but that you don't have responsibility on that portion of it. Right. Right. Well, let's put it this way the FCC, that? back in 1976, the FCC adopted its own NEPA rules. There's the overall statute. Usually with the statute, the way it works, Congress passes a statute, then they tell the agencies to implement their own rules. Okay, back at that time, okay, the agency, for whatever reasons, was not, was more interested in perhaps building out uh, wireless services for voice more than they were uh, in terms of implementing the spirit and the law of NEPA. So they, they drafted rules and the agency that's responsible for overseeing that we did our job properly, CEQ, the Council of Environmental Quality, approved our rules. And those rules at that time did not include a cumulative effects. Well, there is a rule about cumulative effects apparently in this statute or NEPA. There is a, so who enforces it? Well, it, it depends. If, um, if the agency doesn't have it in their rules and the rules were, were approved, there's no rule to enforce because it doesn't apply to the agency. So it's a statute without teeth? There's a lot of statutes without teeth. <laughs> there's a lot of statutes. Okay. Uh, agency's job is to you know, try to draft whatever rules they can that serve the groups that they represent. In this case, you know, the wireless industry. Apparently, there were no uh, citizens out there who were pushing. You know, this was all a public process. Rulemaking is an adjudicatory process that's governed by the Administrative Procedure Act. So the rules went out. There was a notice of proposed rulemaking. People had an opportunity to respond. They didn't. The rules got passed. Okay, but that's what happens when you sit on your duff and let rules get passed and you don't participate. Or when you don't realize what's coming down the pike. And right. The implications. Right. 
Right. So anyway, that's that's the so the background of this. But that's part of that here. question. What is that rule on cumulative effect of something? Well, uh, given that I don't work with it, I, I told okay, you basically. I, right. I told you basically what it is. Yeah. Sure. There are some agencies that do enforce cumulative effects. Now, would the like would wireless carriers like to see a cumulative effect rule? Absolutely not. Okay, that you know that would be disastrous to to do that. But it's not going to happen. These are the rules. Somebody would have to come and propose that we revise our rules to include cumulative effects, and, and um, I, I think the chances of that are nil, not even slim. I think that would be the county could do that. The what? County could do oh, that. county could. Uh, county, state could have their own uh, rules. Various states have their own need rules. California has their own rules. New York has their own rules. Many of those states have them. Okay, so you you get other bites at the apple. If you can't do it at the federal level, you could look at doing it at the state level or some other level. One last thing. Yeah. In, in looking at the regulations for approving a cell tower, right. the FCC has specific rule in there that you cannot deny it for health reasons. A very right. specific rule. Right, that's uh, 332. That's right. part of the statute now, that gave the states the local a, uh, That's a very broad statement. And when you look at uh, the argument that goes on concerning the health of these towers, the, the radiation, uh, there are different aspects. Uh, yes, I'm not going to fry in my living room. Right. But the question of 24-7 low radiation was not addressed in, in, in adequately. So, but that broad rule covers that whole spectrum. Is, right. is that right. reasonable? I'm, I'm no comment. I'm like the guy who just said uh, he didn't give us a name. No comment. I just work for the FCC. But let me tell you this. Okay, the RF rules are dated. Okay, a lot has happened with RF since the commission drafted its rules. Um, and my understanding is with, and there's also a lot of studies that have been released on RF all over, not just here in the US, but all over the world. So I can appreciate your concerns because you're hearing a lot of different things. You're hearing some things from very reliable sources, sometimes the medical industry that are saying, you know, in 10 years, if you keep using that phone up to your head, holding it up there, there is a propensity for, for some sort of cancer or something else. There's a lot of information back and forth. And I think um, my understanding is the current chairman of the FCC is taking a fresh look at what's happening with the RF issue and is in the process. That's my, this is just from what I've heard, is in the process of just revisiting the, the commission's RF requirements. So if citizens are out in judgment on this, right. they don't want to take the chance Right. They feel we don't know that there's a health hazard or right. whether or not there is. But rather than take a chance, we would not like to see that tower approved. Is that a violation of that FCC rule? I believe if you said that it was just based on RF, yes, it would be considered a violation of the rule. Because the current rule, if they could show that the, the current location, the proposed location, is safe to anybody nearby, and they can do that pretty easily. Well, they can go out there. They can only do it easily if you believe the studies. Well, first of all, the, the FCC is going to use its, its existing rules. All right, but, all right, but. Okay, so that said, it's very difficult to knock out a tower on RF. I haven't heard of too many cases where a where a tower a number they have to be negligent to they do the studies beforehand. So somebody would have had to have been. Negligent in the oh, studies. I'm not about Madam President, could I suggest that this colloquy uh, follow the presentation by all three? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're sure. Right. Okay. So as you can see, uh, in terms of process, when when the public certainly can challenge towers, okay, the construction of towers, but it's it's got to be done at the local or the state level first. Okay. If it's not done at that stage, then you have the NEPA process. Then you, there's a historic preservation. There's opportunities there. If you know that there's a, a building, a historic building that's going to be close by, you can make an argument that it would have an adverse effect on that historic building. You can ask to be a consulting party under the commission's rules. We back a few years ago, we adopted a nationwide programmatic agreement 
which had two components. One was to promote co-locations on towers. The other was to make sure that all tower construction complied with the National Historic Preservation Act. That rule that we adopted, the NPA, the programmatic agreement, does give the public an opportunity early in the process to, uh, to request consulting party status, which means you get caught piece of everything that's being submitted. So there are opportunities to, to participate, but get in early in the process, start here, start at your local level, because once it gets to the federal level, it's a lot more difficult. The companies feel a lot more secure. Plus, I can tell you right now, large wireless companies, I would say their compliance with our rules just our rules. Our existing rules is probably 99%. Okay, they're, because if we find a company that isn't complying, we will, but at the very least, issue a pretty significant uh, fine against the companies. The only way a tower is going to come down is if the tower is built on an Indian burial mound. <laughs> <laughs> so that's happened. That's happened in a couple of uh, instances. And uh, <coughs> the towers will come down. If not, the Indian tribes will come in mass and march. Um, not just here, they'll start at Capitol Hill. So if it's built on a mound, the company knows what it has to do, and that is to tear it down. But other than that, the tower's not coming down. They'll get, they'll get fined, uh, but that's going to be the, the extent. And, and it's going to be a significant fine. They know now. The other thing is if they don't comply with our rules, nobody will co-locate on the tower. In other words, that tower is like a building that is uh, that violates rules, that has a cloud on it if you're a lawyer. They won't, they won't co-locate on it. First thing a co-locator does when they go to a tower <coughs> is ask, let me see your paperwork, let me see that it complies with all the rules. Then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll co-locate on the towers. So, the, there's a lot going on. The focus right now is on building out the, the, the antennas, the infrastructure for broadband. And the commission is actively working with state and local governments to do that. In February, we're going to have a forum on DAS. Okay. What is DAS? How does it work? What does it look like? Um, we're going to have experts that are going to show the DAS systems. They're going to, they'll talk about it. Not only, it, it'll be educational. The focus is, what is it? Where is DAS being built? Excuse me. Yes. In the interest of everyone having a chance to make yeah. a presentation, we're going to move on. Okay. All right. And with that, if you want any more information about the DAS forum, let me know. I have some public notices. Here. I'm Thank sure you. there will be time for more questions. Good. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, or, if you'd like to know about DASH, you can pick up a copy of my handout in the back. Uh, they're right on the table, uh, right in the back there. Um, I prepared some slides <coughs> to sort of go through what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, and in, in the back of it, there is a, there's a picture of a, actually, a, a distributed antenna site on MacArthur Boulevard here in Montgomery County. Um, um, uh, so uh, I've been asked to talk about the tower process. I've been asked to keep it at 10 minutes, which might be difficult to do, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, uh, let me start by saying I'm with Columbia Telecommunications, which is an engineering consulting firm. Um, we work only for local governments and educational institutions. We have no, uh, no work for cable operators. We do um, cable television. Uh, uh, technical uh, work as well as uh, wireless um, uh, siting work uh, for local governments. We work with a number of the jurisdictions around the Washington area here. Um, so we really don't have any conflict uh, as, as car the engineering companies that work for the carrier um, and also they work for local governments. We don't have that, we don't have that problem to deal with. But let me start at the beginning back in 1995 um, in the face of um, a new round of uh, auctions of uh, uh, bandwidth for, uh, to expand uh, the use of cell phones nationwide, 
um, Montgomery County uh, anticipated lots of applications for new antenna sites in the county, many of which they knew would require new support structures, new towers and new monopoles. Um, and a task force was formed, it was comprised of representatives from local uh, government agencies, uh, industry representatives, as well as the public. Um, and there was a process they went through and came up with some recommendations which the county adopted, um, and uh, one of which was to form the tower uh, review process and establish the uh, uh, tower coordinating committee. Um, at the time, the county was interested in one, ensuring that these new advanced services would be available to county residents. So they wanted, wanted a process that would get the, get the services out of the community, uh, but they wanted to do that in a way that would minimize the impact of the facilities in the community. Uh, so they addressed uh, some zoning issues, starting with uh, uh, changing the zoning code uh, to do things such as um, uh, try and control the placement of new towers. Uh, they were prohibited in residential zones, for example, except by special exception. Uh, they were per, uh, uh, permitted in <coughs> industrial and commercial areas where they might be better suited in, in that kind of a environment. Um, uh, as I said, they established the, uh, the TFCG and a coordination and review process uh, to hopefully speed these applications through the county agencies um, and expedite deployment of the, uh, of the services. Um, the original application, the first application started coming in in 1996, and since then the committee has uh, processed more than 1,700 applications from the, uh, from the cell carrier providers. Um, uh, um, the, at the same time, uh, as we've alluded to, uh, the federal government uh, also um, uh, took some measures to uh, address these issues as well. Uh, in 96, uh, Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, which among other things, a lot of which had to do with your cable television service, um, uh, also enacted some uh, limits on what local governments could do uh, regarding the placement of these wireless facilities in the community. Um, first of all, and most importantly, local governments uh, worked very hard to make sure this was in the law and it, uh, they retained uh, the authority for local control <coughs> over uh, zoning. <coughs> zoning is local, so it's certainly appropriate, uh, but that's in the statute. So um, uh, the county can, through its zoning ordinance, uh, put in place some measures to uh, govern the, the location of these facilities. Um, they also require that in reviewing applications, they must treat um, uh, all the applicants equitably, uh, treat them all the same. Uh, they prohibited denying an application which a carrier could claim uh, either prohibited or had the effect of prohibiting a carrier's entry into a marketplace. Um, and if there was a denial of, a, of an application, uh, federal law requires that the denial be documented in writing, uh, so there's a record of their, of their action. And uh, in the federal law, that's where the preemption of local governments from uh, denying an application based on the harmful effects of RF emissions from uh, these wireless facilities. So with that sort of regulatory framework, um, the Tower Committee began its work. Um, it, uh, uh, today it's comprised of representatives from um, uh, the public schools, uh, Department of uh, Transportation, um, uh, Information Technology, uh, um, uh, WSSC, um, the Market Planning Commission, um, uh, the Management and Budget, um, and, um, uh, and the Tower Coordinator. <coughs> uh, Margie Williams chairs the meeting. Uh, the meetings are open to the public. They're held the first Monday of each month. And at that, uh, part of, I'm sorry, Wednesday, first Wednesday of each month. Um, and um, uh, at that time, whatever applications have been filed uh, are presented to the committee and they take action on them. The action they can take is either to recommend, not recommend, or recommend with conditions on an application that, this, that they've reviewed. And with that, the applicant can then go to the next step on citing their facility. If they, if they require a special exception, they can go file for the special exception. 
They're going to go get a permit to attach their antennas. They can go to the office and permit it. But they have to have gone through this, this uh, review process um, uh, to begin with. Um, the, um, the process is fairly straightforward. There's a standard application uh, that they all uh, are required to submit, uh, differing uh, depending upon what they're applying for. Uh, if they're just applying to make some minor modifications to antennas at an existing site, we've seen lots of those in the last two years uh, where all the carriers um, are uh, either changing out antennas to deploy new technology or add frequencies to a site um, um, uh, or make some other kind of minor modification to an existing site. Um, uh, that's a less stringent kind of requirement for the supporting documentation that's required with the, with the application. There's a little higher level of uh, documentation required for a co-location of antennas on an existing structure, whether it's a water tank or a PEPCO tower or a building or an existing tower or monopole. And then, of course, for a new tower, there's a lot of additional uh, documentation uh, required, including um, quite a bit of uh, technical data that our engineers, I'm not an engineer, I, do, I handle more the administrative end of uh, ensuring the application is complete, it's accurate, um, it meets the requirements uh, of uh, uh, this, this review process, uh, a preliminary review that meets the zoning code requirements for the application, and um, um, uh, then with, with that work done, then we prepare a recommendation uh, that goes to the tower committee and they take, take action on it um, um, each month. Um, I can tell you that probably the most interest is on new monopoles and towers in the community. Uh, the kinds of things that we are asked to look at is, uh, number one, that it's not a speculative tower. Um, once these facilities are constructed, they are a revenue source for whoever owns the structure because other carriers will move to put their antennas on it. They pay rent, a lot of rent, uh, for use of that, that existing facility. So there are companies that build spec towers. Uh, uh, I guess assuming if, if we build it, they will come, uh, which uh, sometimes is true. Uh, so we look to make sure that what's going in isn't a spec tower. There have been a number that have uh, been, uh, applications have been submitted in Montgomery County, and uh, they have not been successful. Um, uh, we look to see that the, uh, there is no other existing structure in the vicinity to which they could attach their antennas and attain what their coverage objective uh, is for this particular area. Um, uh, and we ask, we ask for documentation uh, for that. If there's something out there that, that we know of that they haven't uh, said they considered, we ask them, did you consider this? If you ruled it out, why not? If it's for uh, technical reasons, let's see the, the the uh, supporting technical documentation. It's for some other reason, the, the landlord won't rent to them, uh, so that, then we need an explanation from you. Um, and on the, the technical data, uh, they submit uh, <coughs> um, a computer model uh, illustrations of what their current coverage is, what their signal levels are in the community, and what this proposed uh, new set of antennas is gonna, is gonna provide. They have to state what it is they're trying to attain and how technically that meets it. Uh, sometimes we get uh, more empirical um, data from them in the form of uh, actual measurements where they have gone into the community and they've raised an antenna, they've turned it on, and they've driven around and measured and actually what signal levels they're getting. Um, and we look to see that uh, the theoretical information matches with the, uh, uh, the drive test results. Um, uh, so uh, we do that evaluation, and we're also asked to look at what the impact of the community is. So we, we look at, um, uh, are there ways that uh, they can minimize the impact of the facility? First of all, is it the minimum needed to meet their requirement? Um, sometimes we get an application for a 180 foot uh, monopole, for example, um, but based on the information they give us, um, we can say it doesn't need to be that high to meet the requirements. And often they'll lower the, they'll lower the height of the structure. Uh, they would like it higher because it's, 
that a better revenue source for them is, is more attractive to other people to place their antennas on the facility. Uh, we try and keep that at a minimum. Um, we look at uh, are there ways they can put the structure on the property that might be in a little less visible uh, location. Um, if there are things that they can do to screen it uh, or to um, uh, use some sort of a, they call it a stealth design. Now, some of you may have seen some of these facilities already, and you can see in my handout I have some photos of them in the, in the back. Some are uh, designed to be a 100-foot flagpole. And inside the flagpole, there are cell antennas. Um, uh, we have some on top of silos or on the sides of, of existing silos uh, in the county. Uh, we even have a couple of um, uh, trees, albeit 150-foot uh, uh, trees that look like uh, ponderosa pines and then a large stand of oak trees. But, um, uh, and some of them work, some of them don't work. Um, I guess beauty is in the eye of the, of the beholder. Um, but just briefly, those are some of the things that we do in our review. Yes, sir. I have one question. You, they co-located a number of uh, antennas on top of the temporal lines that seem to be rusting away rather rapidly. Is there any requirement to do any way of rusting away to sort of protect the public safety that these towers have to maintain them? PEPCO takes responsibility for the facilities. But they're on. rusting now. I mean, you can obviously see they're rusting away. Uh, I would call PEPCO. And we have, we've, had, we've had some applications uh, to attach on PEPCO structures, and there have been residents nearby that have come in and complained about how they look or um, Which is the rust screening. Which concerns me that these towers are going to fall. Uh, if it falls, my concern would be the loss of the electrical power than it right. would than it were the cell site. Right. That's, that's strictly a PEPCO issue. That's not something we look at. We do ask uh, about um, the structural integrity and its abilities to support new antennas being added. And that's become more of an issue or concern in more recent years because these, these structures are filling up. There are more and more carriers coming to the community, more and more uh, antennas being added. Uh, I think Verizon at some sites has as many as 15 antennas on a structure. Some of the monopoles and towers have six and seven carriers on board. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot of structural analysis reports where um, before anything else can be added to it, um, uh, they'll have to uh, either reinforce it or redesign it or provide some additional support. And that's something that's looked at in the permitting, uh, county's permitting process. They have a structural engineer that looks at those reports. We look at them when we get them to make sure that the analysis is considered all of the antennas that are on there today and all of the ones that have been through the tower committee that may be on there in the future. Um, uh, and we also look at any potential uh, RF uh, uh, conflicts. And now there's a company right now, uh, uh, LightSquare, that has an issue before the FCC whose uh, bandwidth <coughs> is right adjacent to the frequencies for GPS navigational uh, uh, frequencies. Um, if they turn their service on today, there could be uh, GPS systems that don't, there's going to be interference and they won't work well. Uh, that could affect any one of you with your GPS in your car, to your, to your cell phone, to public safety uh, uh, services. Aviation. Um, to uh, aviation, to the carrier's uh, own sites that have, they all have uh, GPS uh, facilities at the site that control the timing of their signals and the technical operation of the facility. Uh, uh, even down to the, uh, I saw one response to the FCC from a, a man who has a very large farm, I presume, someplace in the Midwest, and he has a $35,000 GPS navigation system in his tractor um, to manage um, uh, the planting and harvesting of these huge uh, 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 agricultural uh, facilities. Yes, sir. Are, are there any criteria that uh, establish some sort of a maximum number of uh, towers that could be put in a particular uh, locality, or not just the free market? No, we do look. We do look to the. As I said the first thing we look at is there an existing structure that um, uh, you can use to place your antennas. Uh, the county doesn't want to grow antenna farms, uh, tower farms. Um, there are a few places where there are two monopoles. There's one right on, you see it right on the spur, I-270 spur, uh, going toward uh, the river. 
Uh, there's a country club there. There's two monopoles there. There's a handful of locations like that in the county. Each one is put up for whatever uh, technical <coughs> justification supports that. Um, uh, but that's one of the things that we look at uh, as we do uh, as we do our review. Um, can I get a water zoo? Care about human beings because I've heard everything that I've said. All you're doing is take care of your own technical issues, but you can't you can't care about radiation and what that might do to people. Well, as I said, the, the federal the federal government, when they enacted the Telecommunications Act, prohibited local governments from denying and uh, placing a facility based on harmful RF effects. Yeah. And they gave that, they gave the responsibilities to, for, for determining what that level might be to the FCC. The FCC established uh, a set of um, uh, standards uh, for placement of facilities. And in my handout, you'll see a, a website that you can go to and you can, there, there's one in sort of plain language. The, the original, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess ruling from the uh, it's established the rules from the FCC is about this thick. It's very very technical. It's all math. I look at it and gloss over. But uh, there was a local government um, uh, group uh, 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 that uh, tried to put that work into plain language. And it's a, it's a local government regulator's guide to uh, RF emissions. I'd encourage you to go to the FCC and take a look at it. Uh, we have we have when we see uh, cases where there are lots of antennas. There've been a couple of rooftop locations um, where obviously there's a lot of RF up there, and it can be harmful. Um, and we have asked at a couple of occasions, "Have you done a cumulative RF study?" And uh, in some cases. Um, they do exceed the limits, and if they exceed the limits, there are rules at the FCC that the carrier has to take um, for as far as signage and protecting uh, uh, workers on a rooftop, for example, uh, from RF emissions. So uh, I care about people, <laughs> but there's nothing I, as, as in this capacity, nothing the local government can do to deny an application based on that. It's an FCC matter. Can you do something about it? The federal government doesn't do anything about it. You're telling me the county government, they say the county and state government is supposed to do it. You're telling me the county government. Who the hell does care about the people? Let's, can we, yes. we should really move on. We want to have opportunities for everybody to make the presentation and then carry on with the question and answer, okay? But think about Bill's question, please, because I think a lot of people have the same question. The um, let me let me try and wrap things up so we can get some more answers to some of the questions that you have. Um, so I guess to sort of summarize the work of the committee to date, as I mentioned, uh, they re they've reviewed more than 1,700 applications in Montgomery County uh, since '96. Um, they've recommended um, uh, 1,550 of them. Most of them are co-locations on existing structures, a little over a thousand of them. Uh, 419 of them, and this is through the end of FY11, uh, were these minor applications, the minor modification applications that I talked about. And there have been 123 new towers and monopoles that have been recommended by the committee. Some have gone forward and are constructing. Some, uh, for whatever reason, the carrier opted not to pursue building it, uh, and they're not there today. Um, uh, but there are there are a lot of a lot of towers in, in this region. This is a very hot market in the wireless industry. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, it's very competitive, and um, uh, there is a lot of activity. As I mentioned, especially lately, as the carriers are getting ready to roll out their you heard of uh, 4G uh, uh, services, their LTE services. Um, that provide uh, the users, uh, many of you, with your, uh, with your smartphones, all these advanced broadband services that are so much in demand. Um, I'm not going to go through, I've got this toward the back of my uh, handout, I've got some additional information um, and with some photos of some of these disguised sites, these uh, stealth, uh, stealth sites. 
there is some information about a distributed antenna network, which I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and there's also some information um, uh, about what it is the carriers give us to uh, document the technical uh, support they need for the carrier, sort of how they determine the need for antennas, uh, the kinds of things that we look at and comment on to the tower committee. So uh, I think that's it for me. We have to answer questions, Sue, if you want to. Sue, why don't you, um, you, I know you can prepare a presentation also. Maybe we can hold up on questions until afterward. Okay, that's so. All right. Um, I used to develop a lot of workshops and panel presentations, and uh, one time when I was uh, having particular dif difficulty in locating an expert to speak, I called upon a dear friend and learned colleague of mine um, to come to my aid, and he was uh, very willing to do so. He began his presentation by saying, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> I, I tell you this because it was uh, very similar circumstances, the lack of a true expert and uh, the, group, my, the group of which I was one uh, opponent, um, uh, neighbor opponents, uh, where there was a cell tower being proposed near my home um, that propelled me to become that proverbial one-eyed man uh, among all of us. Um, when, when this problem came about. And um, uh, unlike my fellow panelists who have official titles and positions that uh, link them to tonight's topic, I, I think it was those circumstances and uh, the experiences that followed that uh, bring me here today. Um, I've been asked to share information with you tonight, both about uh, what I did right and what I did wrong and give you some advice and. I'm going to try to do that. Uh, my first bit of advice is start early, uh, as early as absolutely possible. The, the, lear the learning curve I found to be incredibly steep. You're going to encounter a lot of delays, and it's difficult to, to digest the information. Um, we were not fortunate to be able to uh, work with an attorney uh, throughout the process. Uh, I came across some people in the audience tonight that, that are fortunate to have one working with them. That's great. But regardless, start early. Do as much as you can as soon as you can. Uh, no one talked about the shot clock rule that came about in 2010, but my process began before then. Since then, the entire process working through the, the county um, has become condensed. Now, um, the, the entire process has become condensed, but the part that is most important that I want to tell you about is that it is only within the first 30 days after an application has been filed that incomplete portions of the application, incomplete information can be brought to the applicant's attention. After that, too late. That's the new FCC rule. Now, fortunately, the way the county is interpreting this FCC rule, uh, there are two processes, one for the tower committee's application process and one for the subsequent cell tower siting process. So there are two different applications for which there will be that 30-day review of the application, applications, there are two different applications, to see whether or not they are complete. And complete to some extent means completely accurate. So you're going to want to get in there as soon as possible to help to make sure that those applications are accurate because it takes more than one set of eyes, two set of eyes, ten set of eyes sometimes to make sure that they're accurate. Next piece of advice, be curious and also be cautious. Seek information with total curiosity. Don't presume that there's only one answer or one interpretation. And I'll get to part of what you were asking about concerning RF emissions and health a little bit later. <coughs> if 
you should encounter certain familiarity between the applicant and various county staff or officials, don't let that be off-putting. It is <laughs> likely to happen because they're there all the time. They will become friendly, but don't <clears throat> let that <throat> friendliness be mistaken for bias. Bias in favor of the carrier. Lots of these county folks have good information and gui guidance to share. So be open to all that they have to offer. However, always question the information. Presume that every detail in the application, every assertion made by the applicant, and no disrespect to what you've said here tonight, my fellow panelists, but even the guidance that you may receive from government officials and determinations that may be made by county officials, they're open to interpretation and debatable. Everything. The laws are relatively new, and in many cases, they've not yet received high-level court reviews. So there's a certain amount of wild west that remains in this process. Basic strategy. If you and your neighbors are concerned about a, a potential tower, then coordinate your efforts and assemble your home team immediately. Find various neighbors and friends who are experts. It doesn't necessarily mean experts in towers. Uh, experts who can help you review the applications for errors and issues and help with what will be your eventual case. You want all different types of experts. You want engineers <laughs> of various stripes. You want architects, photographers, lawyers, planners, media people, um, people in regulatory affairs, FCC <laughs> related people, FAA related people, appraisers, mortgage bankers, realtors, librarians, bloggers, you name it, you want them because the carriers have lots and lots of money to pay lots and lots of experts. But also, you want just other neighbors in that uh, have flexible schedules who are concerned too. You want them because they will be able to go and gather information and attend meetings and hearings. The county process is not accommodating for most of our schedules. It accommodates the lawyers and the county staff. The meetings and the hearings and the access to live information takes place during the time that most of us are at work. And I can tell you because I used to sit on a board of appeals, not here someplace else. It doesn't work like that every place, but it works like that here. Apply navigation techniques. You're going to need to understand all the laws and all the rules and all of the processes, both for a good offense and for a good defense. So seek guidance and try to familiarize yourselves. Become familiar by attending each type of meeting or hearing that you might end up attending for your own case. And review the files and transcripts and results from similar cases. If possible, try to find people to coach and guide you. People who've been through similar processes. They don't need to be attorneys. Even someone with an experience in another county can be of help. Become familiar with your information slash destination points. Uh, you may need to contact or visit at least three different county offices for inquiries and to explore information. And that includes Ms. Williams' Cable and Communications Office. It includes an office that it goes by the acronym OZA, the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings, and, it go and also the Board of Appeals Office. They're all located in this building. Unfortunately, much information is not available online, and be careful about what you do find online from these offices. Because 
It's often incomplete, not kept up to date, or posted in a very confusing fashion so that you might retrieve part of it, but not all of it. When you find the neighbors that share your concerns, coalesce, but do not form an official group. Applicant corporations, companies, and organizations have a requirement for early submission deadlines and in some venues must be represented by attorneys. It's a rule. Give yourselves the maximum flexibility by not being officially organized. So I said there are two applications. The first one goes before the Tower Committee for review. And in cases where the Tower applicate, that Tower proposition would be proceeding to a zoning review later, there would be a first determination of need before the Tower Committee. And that uh, determination of need, just to be clear, is a determination of corporate need not community need. There are other sections in the zoning ordinance that talk about community need. That's not what we're talking about here. It's need of the corporation. Later, there is a separate determination of need that must be made by the Board of Appeals, an independent determination of need made by the Board of Appeals also for corporate need. Now, once the Tower Committee completes its process, there's a separate siting application. In cases where the zoning, or, the zoning ordinance requires a special exception application, the application has to be approved by the Board of Appeals. Those applications first receive reviews through OZA, and that goes through a hearing process before a hearing examiner, and culminates in a report and a recommendation to the Board of Appeals. The Board then deliberates and renders a decision. The Board's decision, when it is issued in print, is called the Board's Opinion. Telecommunications facilities that are on public use and located on public, that are for public use and located on public land, meaning both of those criteria, public use and public land, have a separate process called mandatory referral. And that involves a report and recommendation by the planning board instead of by OZA. It is again a hearing and an advisory recommendation. But it's a different body. And instead of the recommendation going to a final process like the Board of Appeals, which makes a decision that is enforceable, there is no enforceable decision at the end. There is only a recommendation. The Planning Board's guidance is generally highly regarded by the other, by the government agencies that receive. Now, each process has two parts. The application par part is the part that you're going to be looking at for completeness. The remaining part after that first 30 days, you're going to be dealing with on the basis of sufficiency. Uh, I've, I'm not going to talk too much about the sufficiency with the Tower Committee. Um, it's fairly difficult to um, do any sort of challenging before the Tower Committee because uh, a lot of the information is simply inaccessible, either because of the uh, proprietary and confidential aspects of the information that is in the applications, or because uh, I, I can't tell which uh, towers are available. I don't know if others can. There's a database, but you can't tell which are actually towers that are uh, existing versus ones that are simply um, those that had been proposed and had a decision. And even if you could tell which ones are which, you wouldn't necessarily know which ones are filled up and which ones are not. 
So anyway, we're having to do with the special exception. Opponents need to question and challenge the ability to meet the standards for a special exception. The carrier, the carrier will generally try to characterize the proposed tower as much as possible as plain vanilla. In other words, like all the other ones that have been pr approved for a special exception. Opponents need to point out how to OZA how a particular proposal, site, or situation is different and does not meet the standards that would cause harm. Now, I don't want to underestimate for a moment that there is value in numbers and power in who will come to those hearings. Uh, a couple of the people in the audience talked to me ahead of time about how they had businesses that were coming to these hearings as well as residents. And I think that can be extremely effective. It can also be ex extremely effective if you have media coverage. But I think that you need a combination of getting your um, case uh, successfully carried through in, in the process along with um, fighting your case in the court of public opinion. Excuse me, Ms. President. In the interest of having a few minutes left for Q&A, sure. could you bring your, your presentation to a conclusion, please? So there are three steps. The first, your first step is going to be with cable and communications, um, where there's the tower committee application. Then the next step is application to, that, that goes uh, to the Board of Appeals and through OZA, and then there is the hearing process that begins with OZA and wraps up at the Board of Appeals. Um, I'm going to stop there and say, um, it sounds like you have lots of questions as to how to make it work, and I simply uh, think that there are alternatives for dealing with uh, health emissions as well as lots of other things as far as winning the case. Thank you. And I would like to go back to a question raised earlier, which I don't know if there is an answer for, but who does look after health considerations for the people that live by a cell tower? Who Anyone? does? No one? Anyone? Anybody? Well, as, um, as was indicated, the FCC has, a, has RF rules that are in place. Okay, we have a, a group called the Office of Engineering and Technology. OET. There's a chief engineer there. Uh, their job is to make sure that those rules which were passed by the, the FCC commission, okay, in other words, the staff doesn't, their job is to, uh, to make sure that the existing rules are enforced. Okay, that's, so there is, there is a, the, bo the bottom line is there is a bureau that's responsible for making sure that the the public is protected but in that terms being of said, The rules are static. Information is constantly being accumulated as to effects. And is there nobody that looks at new coming scientific and medical evidence to say, this rule may not be working? How can we reshape the rules so that people are protected? Well, I don't work in that, that group to see what they do. But I would suspect there probably are engineers that are looking at them. Uh, they may have made a recommendation that the rules be revised, but ultimately <coughs> it's up to the commission to revise the rules. Okay. And they might be responsive to public pressure if well, there is now the politician I mean, they're, one way or another. Right. I mean, so. the commission or the existing chairman is, was appointed by the president. There's. Uh, there are, right now, we have two Democrats, one Republican, and so they're, you know, they know what, what direction the wind is blowing. And, but they serve, they, they don't, they are up on the eighth floor, because we, all, we always say they're up in the sky. <laughs> the staff that works at the, the lower levels, and, but it's, they, they are the decision makers for the agency. Okay, I'm a decision maker. Can I have another okay. question? Yep. Yes, uh, I come from the same community that Sue lives in, and unfortunately, I can tell you that for our community, uh, this cell tower was tremendously divisive. Uh, a cell company came in, uh, and to the aid of a local swim club, and we all know that the local swim clubs are having problems, and they shoehorned this tower application 
um, to uh, fit into a, a really rather limited area. What's amazing about it is that we didn't really know about it until the special exception process had started. It is very difficult to know that something's coming to your community, although Mr. Honeycutt indicated that uh, they publicize uh, information or their agendas are on the web, um, I beg to differ. You will not know if an application is going through for your community in any easy to figure out way through the tower committee. You in fact will end up with a piece of paper from the Board of Appeals probably first so that it is difficult and you do have to go back and check the work of the Tower Committee, but it's not a really citizen-friendly front door to the application at all. Uh, so that's number one. But number two, and really uh, just to clarify, what Sue was saying is uh, for most of us in communities, you'll either have a special exception or a mandatory referral. And actually, that decision is very interesting when you start talking about school properties. If it's a private owner of a residential property, it will be a special exception. But if it's a school property, and if they decide that the cell tower is also going to hold up lights for the sports stadium, then it will be a mandatory referral. And the school system well, and this is, this is the big debate because there are some debates about that, Mr. Honeycutt. Um, if it is, in fact, just a cell tower, which the school system gets paid on, and not doing any other duty, it is supposed to be a special exception. However, I don't think any of those applications have come through because there is some decision and discussion with the school <coughs> system about how they want to handle that. They really haven't totally bought into that yet. So if you see an application in your area, you need to know what it is. And if it is a school-related application, there is another approach, and that's through the PTA. But I, I hope that helps to clarify for practicality. Janice, and then Gary. Gary. I just want to follow up on your, your comment about the school system. And Mr. Honeycutt, I understand there are certain things you can and cannot do on the Tower Commission. Um, but when it comes to putting a cell tower on school property, the legal owner of the property is the Board of Education. The Board of Education has never authorized a cell tower to go on a school site, yet the Tower Commission has approved the applications that have been put before them by the cell tower companies, which tells me that I can put in an application to put a cell tower on Paula's property without her permission, because that's what's going on. So th that's where I really have a concern with the Tower Commission. If, if you, you have limited things you can do, I understand that, but how is it that you can authorize a cell tower to be placed on property without the owner's permission? Because that is what you have done about a dozen times. Yeah. Well, what we, <clears throat> what we first do is check with uh, our, our person that's on the Tower Committee from the public schools and uh, ask her, if, is, is she aware of the application? She's not the owner. Well, she's the one that we that we coordinate. I understand, with. but she's not the owner. And, and um, the uh, the public schools has a policy, which I'm sure you're aware of, about siting the facilities, and you really don't process anything until it's been through the tower committee and been through the other uh, the other requirements. Well, the policies that's that's the way but I. But that's their policy. The policy. That shouldn't affect you and how you're right. taking an application because that goes back. I, I can to my just statement. tell you what I do. I call the I call the public schools and say I've got this application for a new tower on your site. Are you aware of it? Well, but yeah. you could call Paula and say, Are you aware that Janice wants to put a tower on your property? She'd say, right. Yeah, she's aware. It doesn't mean you have permission. I hear what you say, and, and and you're not the first person who's brought that complaint to uh, to our attention. I can tell you that um, Margie and her office. Uh, are looking at some changes to the regulations to address that specific. Right, because your office should go by property. your rules, not somebody right. else's right. supposed policy, which I would argue separately with you doesn't say what you say it says. But, but well, I'm the, sorry, thank you. I just want to follow up on this all the issue. All the applications that we look at for public schools property today, um, our recommendation is they need a special exception because it's not the public schools that's putting up a monopole. Even if there's school lights on it, it's a public use, I mean a private use on public property. 
requires a special exception. That's with every one of our recommendations for sites on public school property. So and that, that's been our direction from <coughs> the Office of the County Attorney. I am required to make a determination whether it's a public use or private use, and that's what we do as part of our review. All right. I'll extend this till 920, but I do want to say please keep your questions very short and quick. When is Montgomery County Public Schools going to do what Walton, Massachusetts has already done? They have no printed textbooks in their high school, but gave each student an iPad which needs additional wireless access to the I, mean, I think that's that a question way. for the school system, Jerry. Yeah, we'll not, come back for our teachers. When are, when are we going to go that route? It they, saves they've them already done it. They already have wireless in the schools, but yeah. that's another topic. Do we have a question again about? Yes. I will tell you, as far as public schools go, and the neighborhoods around them, I live across the street from John F. Kennedy High School, not up by the school but actually down at the, uh, for the athletic field. Right. Right. Now, a cell tower was put up on that property. The people in the neighborhood were never notified that it was coming about. There was no information on it. There was nothing in the paper, nothing at all. And I think more, more important and, and is what, that the what, abutting and adjoining neighbors were not given the proper special exception notice. And when the school, somebody in the school said they were concerned about the radiation affecting the children, the answer was, oh, well, we're not going to put it down where the children are. They, they, don't worry about that. It's right across the street from my house. <laughs> yeah. And I've been here for ever since it was there. We never had any word whatsoever that it was going up. What's the question? Uh, yes. Why does that sort of thing, you know, between the federal government and the county government, somebody should be doing something about letting the people know so they can know what's happening because there's no publicity requirement whatsoever. Well, I, I'd encourage you to take a look at the public schools policy because there is, there is, a, there is a, a process they go through within the school. And I know that some of the sites have been turned down uh, after the PTA has voiced an opinion on it. And um, uh, the principal is, or the principal has said, we don't, we're not interested in leasing here. The policy says the that they're supposed to notify and involve the entire community. Right. However, if you look at the tower committee meeting minutes, the meeting minutes indicate that the practice is to only notify the PTA. Yeah. Who set, who set up the tower process. committee? You said you wanted these to be short. Can I yeah. Sure, go ahead. Okay. okay. I, I what do you see. think would be the single most powerful argument against the cell phone tower? Property assessments, for example? I, I don't think that it is a, a universal argument. And the reason is because the way the zoning ordinance is written, you have to have specific arguments based upon specific sites. In other words, there are uh, what are called <laughs> there are um, hold on, I'm getting the word, sorry. Thank you. There are inherent and non-inherent characteristics of cell towers. And they cannot be denied on the basis of inherent characteristics. And so your most effective argument has to be on the basis of a non-inherent characteristic that is specific to the one that is proposed by you. Okay, uh, we've, we've got about one minute, so I'm going to ask Regarding you. this question and the tax assessor, um, in our opinion, I talked to the appeals board yes. tax assessor, mm -hmm. and they will take into consideration the proximity of a cell tax. Correct. And they will reduce the assessment under certain circumstances. Correct. Now, that means somebody is suffering a financial loss. Yes. Who's responsible for that financial loss? Now, I'm not talking about the whole community, but clearly, this thing is in your backyard. Your property has been devalued. Uh, where does that come into the system that those people get compensated? Do they have to go to civil court then? The, the zoning ordinance includes an evaluation of whether or not there will be economic detriment. 
not only is there an issue about whether or not there would be a cell tower affecting surrounding homeowners, there's also the issue about um, FHA mortgages and the, the, it being a part of the nuisance uh, characterization, nuisance uh, category. At, cell towers are in the category of nuisances. But is that addressed in the county? Oh, right now there's a, a case for our community before the appeals board. Mm -hmm. And I've read that documentation. Yes. And I've seen nothing in it about the assessment, property assessment. That's an entirely separate process and would probably have to come after the cell no, tower. it's not separate. Yeah. It's part of your yeah, argument. She's saying it's part of it and okay. it's not. But how do you document it and show that from your own experts? I well, first of all, you've got a county appeals board gentleman that says your property will be affected. All right, Ernie, would you speak much? to this, please? Oh Here is our county appeals expert. <laughs> Really? You're the guy I talk to, right? <laughs> 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 I'm sure. <laughs> what I told you was that it is just one of many factors that are considered in evaluating the market value of your home. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you walk out your front door and there's a cell phone across the street, it reduces the market value. It may reduce the market value of your home, so that it's, that's that's. The ultimate issue is the effect on the marketability of your home. And what we deal with as the property tax assessment deals with is more of an art than a science. I can't tell you that because you have a cell phone or a tower across the street, you know, and it's 199 feet tall, how much the devaluation of the property is. We know it's something we have to consider it as a board in determining. Okay. Can I ask my Could I, could I ask, <laughs> is there a motion to extend the program another five minutes? Yes. All agree? Yes. Okay, and you won't run away because we do have a resolution <coughs> to vote on afterwards. Is so that the promise? question I have? Yes. I mean, Go ahead, Arnie. The question I have is, in your slide seven on here, on, page, on your page two, you have evaluation of visual impact as part of the application. Arnie, speak louder, please. Okay. You have as part of the application review the evaluation of the visual impact. Um, what can be done to minimize the community impact of the new tower? Actually, I think what you mean is what can be done to minimize the impact on the community of the new tower? Of a big honk and ugly tower. Right. How can you review that before the structure is? Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of different ways. Um, there, there are photo simulations that the carrier usually submits, um, illustrating what it will look like from certain different perspectives, certain different directions. They usually, the ones I've seen, usually are taken from, I get a lot of pictures that say structure not visible. They take a picture from where they can't see the monocle. Uh, I go to places when I do my site visit, uh, I've probably been to your house, and if you look at my report, I'll bet you there's a picture from your street uh, about that particular cell tower. Cell okay. 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 But I, let me just finish. Uh, and so I go to places where it's gonna be most prominently viewed. And I do my own illustration um, uh, to try and give us give a sense of what this is going to look like. Approximately, how tall is it going to be? How big is it going to be? And where it's going to be uh, in the community? So that's part of our review that we give uh, we give the tower committee, and it's something that goes through the process, through the planning <coughs> commission, and through the board of appeals that they see that. Um, and then and then then we look at well, you know, what can be done to minimize this. Uh, if it's in a wooded area, can you disguise it as a tree? And, and we've done that with applications and the carriers have responded. Um, can you uh, make it a, uh, a, a silo or, or a, a flag or things like that? So that's, that's about the extent of what we can do, but that's how we, that's how we address it. Are these photo simulations that you are preparing something that's new? Because I have not seen them in any of the cases that I've reviewed. Uh, I do them all the time. I don't know I'm just else. asking as far as them being Oh, there no, it's not. I've been, I've been doing it all along, yeah. And you have referred these and, and provided well, them the, to OZA and the Board of Appeals? Photo simulations come from the carriers. I do my own I'm simulation. I'm talking about your own. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've done can, can you name a couple of cases where I would find these? Uh, any, any new tower recommendation form from us. All right, could we wrap it up with the last question from Jim Hunter? Well, I, I just have a very generic question about notification to the neighborhood. If it's a special exception, uh, we, the association might get a notice from the Board of Appeals or from the hearing examiner, I'm guessing. Is there a sign that appears on the property? A sign appears within three days after the spe special exception is filed, and the adjoining and confronting neighbors receive a letter within okay. seven days. So that yeah, yeah, the sign goes up in three days, you've still got 27 days to meet your 30-day uh, period. Okay, uh, it's a mandatory referral. What's the first time I hear about it? It goes on the agenda of the planning board? Right. Yes. Which may be several days or weeks into the 30-day period. <coughs> I'm getting a nod yes. Okay. The, the, so that's really an inadequate problem. Okay, the, 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 notice, the notice requirements are something that Margie's office is taking a look at as well. So okay. you may see some changes in, in that in the future. And, and my last question is real quickly, you could, could, could uh, your office, Margie, try and ensure that the agenda for these meetings and perhaps the minutes be posted? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that one I will take away from A few months this. ago, the agenda was a year old. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I will work with uh, the folks that work on the uh, websites because the only thing I've taken away is the fact that you see it's on the apps and maybe when the applications are coming into the county, since we are the first ones that receive them, what we are doing is an engineering review. So, you know, there are many steps beyond ours. Maybe what we could do is build a place where the applications as they're being received in the county, we're just going to put them out there. I won't even put them that they're on an agenda yet. Yeah. Just these have been received on these dates and then update the that. Location, the the okay. Okay. Yeah, and the location. the location. So, yeah. absolutely. Before you go far, our, our five minutes are getting stretched. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Two last questions here and then there. I'd just like to ask Mr. Honeycutt, how can you justify approving uh, an application when the basic idea of it's not being presented by the property owner? It, it, it starts off the application. It seems like it's a violation of your own rules. How could you, how could uh, it, far it, as I know, uh, uh, there's no requirement uh, to submit a lease agreement, something like that. Um, uh, there have been, all I can tell you is, at least for the public properties, the county, WSSC, um, uh, planning Party commission, um, I, I do call and say, we've got this application, are you aware of it? And um, that's it. Um, Sue mentioned the there's a shot clock uh, ruling that the FCC has issued at the request of the industry <laughs> that says um, uh, thou shalt uh, move on and act on an application within a certain period of time. Um, uh, we have we have 30 days to review it, determine if it's in, uh, a complete or not. Um, How could it and be done clear? Then. There's 90 days for a co-location. Uh, we have 90 days to act on it. If it's a, a new tower or monopole, it's 150 days to act on it. But and the, these are, then I can tell you that the counties always met those, almost always met those, uh, uh, those requirements. The county does a good job of process. It, it, I, I work with a lot of different jurisdictions, not just around here, but across the country. And I, I, in my opinion, Montgomery County has a good effective process. Although it may have a lot of problems, um, and there's a lot of problems in dealing with these new monopoles, um, but it's a pretty good process here. Okay. Um, so. One absolutely last question. Well, it's actually a comment huh. on the property values. Uh, what Sue probably could have filled in a little more information on is that you really need Some experts. Money. If property value issues are going to be your argument before the Board of Appeals or the hearing examiner, you need expert testimony. I can tell you that cell phone tower people have a list of experts that they can produce that will tell you that there is absolutely no effect to your property value. And even when the expert says, and this is a quote, my wife probably wouldn't buy the house, but that really doesn't change the value of that house. Uh, they admit that your market is constrained with that tower there, but they will not agree that in fact your property value will be lowered. So you need to not yourself say it's a property value issue. You need a hired gun that is going to testify and be qualified as an expert before the hearing examiner in order to be taken seriously. 
So we can let the experts shoot it out, and we're going to have to stop right now and thank Ms. Prinnis.